So. What are you doing in your summer to actually play the game and challenge yourself in that environment as much as possible so when you do come into the fall, you're ready to go. Mm -hmm. And you've almost mm -hmm. improved your capacity as a player in order to make sure that come the season, you're not only ready and you're not just surviving, but you're thriving, thriving. right? Yeah. And I think like that's been really big for me in my two years here is just making sure that every player has an opportunity in their summer to try to play the game at a high level. Welcome back everyone to the FC Game Changer Show. And today we're in Salem, Oregon at Willamette University speaking with Sam Edelman. Sam is the head coach of Willamette men's soccer team and in his second season as a head coach, he's already making a huge impact on the team. In this past fall season, Willamette University was ranked number seven in all NCAA. The team won the Northwest Conference and they made it to the second round of the NCAA tournament. This is awesome. Uh, Sam, thank you so much for taking the time to be here with us and welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. Thank you for making the drive to Salem. Thanks for visiting our beautiful campus here. And I'm really excited to chat with you today, man. Yeah, this is, you know, with the intro, you know, I'm, I'm actually impressed. Just your second season, you know, as the head coach. Thank you. And uh, this is awesome. So we're going to be talking about you, the philosophy that you have as a coach, you know, talk about the players, Willamette University and how things are going, you know, the way you're thinking about the future for the team and things like that. Yeah. So to, to kick this off, uh, tell us a little bit more, you know, about Willamette University and the team. Yeah, so just a little bit about Willamette, you know, I think it's really important to kind of create the context of the university itself. Um, first university west of the Mississippi that was ever established here in the U.S., um, which is crazy to think about, right? Like right. any recruit that I have on campus, any family that I have on campus, when I first got here as a student athlete myself, back in uh, 2012 now, that was always the craziest statistic to me. You know what I mean? Is that like, that's just so unique in itself, right? To be here and really Salem is the capital city in Oregon. I think it originated with the university being established because we are so centralized to the rest of this city. You know, everything kind of branches out from Willamette and the fact that we are kind of at the heart of the capital here has always been really unique to me and always really cool. I think a lot of the ins and outs of Salem and a lot of the growth that Salem's experiencing kind of comes through Willamette mm -hmm. and it starts with this place, right? So um, just incredible to always kind of remind myself of that fact, right? That like as the capital city in this state, this is kind of where it all started, you know what I mean? And especially higher education on this side of the Mississippi, this is the example, right? The gold standard, as you might say. So um, that was always really, you know, interesting to me. I just need to, you know, point that factoid out here. That's a definitely fun fact, yeah. Itself. Um, men's soccer, though, you know, as, as, as a player back in 2012, we have come such a long way. Right. And, and, I, and I'm very humbled and honored to be the head coach now, as you mentioned, in my second season here, where as a player coming into this position, I've kind of had the blessing of understanding like the past, where we've been and, and the present, where we're at. Mm -hmm. And then with that timeline, also looking to establish the future of where we're going to go, you know, and I kind of have that. I'm, I am a beneficiary in a lot of ways just to kind of understand that, like, that timeline of where we've been and knowing that process of like how far we've come and how we've gotten there and what it's taken, where we're currently at, but then also the objectives and the goals and the vision mm -hmm. that we have for the next five years. Yes. That's an incredible thing to me, but I think at the end of the day, like where we're at currently, you know, uh, my senior year, for example, I think we won like six games out of, you know, like a 20, 20 game season. Um, the year before that, as a player, that was actually like my closest season to winning the conference title. The Northwest Conference in Division III um, is a really, really competitive conference, right? So just to kind of map that out, like there's eight teams, nine teams now, because Lewis and Clark on the men's side will actually join us this next season. Um, 
which is great. I, I can't wait for just another opponent because, you know, for again, for 10 years, we've been kind of playing the same people twice each yeah. season over and over again. Um, but with that eight, it's a double round robin format. So you play everyone twice. And it's super competitive in that way because you can realize it's difficult to play everyone two times. You know what I mean? And then there's no conference tournament at the end. So with 400 teams in Division Three and only 64 teams that make the national tournament, mm -hmm. slim odds, especially with all the schools in D3 being kind of located out in the East Coast, there's not a lot of eyes out here on the West based on, like, who's doing really well, right? And, and I say that, and it's important to understand that because one team out of our conference will make the national tournament. So in my years as a player, uh, it was, I think, 2014, the fall of 2014, we lost the conference by a single point. And that was the closest as a player that, that I had to like winning the conference and getting that automatic bid. Potential for an at-large bid, right, to, to also be in those top 64 teams. I would argue that we were maybe one of the top 64 teams in the country at that time, but didn't quite get that respect, right? There's a lot of teams elsewhere uh, that we don't necessarily have the perspective of, or on, I should say, and ultimately some other committee that knows the entire landscape gets to make those decisions at the end of the day. So now that we kind of understand, you know, like my significance as a player in terms of how winning uh, or how much winning we actually did, I think it's important to understand now that like you, you've listed off some big accomplishments for us this last year, you know, seventh in the country at one point. That's huge. Um, winning the conference for the second time in the last five years, uh, having some of our players, you know, one of our players, Pierce Galloway, first team All-American, you know, awesome. and, and, and just to kind of have some of those accolades and achievements to our program now really kind of demonstrate how far we've come. And ultimately, you know, one of the coolest things about our future is we played in Chicago for the national tournament this last year. And what a humbling experience because that's an amazing institution, University of Chicago. Have you ever been or anything? Haven't, like that? So have it's, not. We, we, we ate on campus, Armando, and like the place we ate at like was Hogwarts, I swear. It was the, 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 the layout was incredible in that regard. Such a beautiful place. Um, I love Willamette, but University of Chicago is just in the heart of the city, right. just a little bit more grandiose in that way. And uh, that's a program that maintains the number one ranking in the country pretty much all season. So you get to go to there in the middle of November, and it's windy, it's cold, um, and you have to play against the top team in the country, mm. right? And that's what we had to look forward to. We won the first round, and then the, you know that night, I'm staying up till about 4 or 5 a.m., scouting University of Chicago. I'm watching so many games and seeing what we can do. They end up winning the whole thing, man. They, they end up being the national champion. So when we lost that game, we lost to the eventual national champion. And what we got out of that trip, Armando, is like their whole staff and the admin and all these people were just like, you guys remind us a lot of us when we started finding our success. That's interesting. And just like their praise and respect of our class, our culture, the way we play the game, the way we carry ourselves in victory or defeat, that was eye-opening. Mm. That was eye-opening. But it definitely kind of shows that we're headed in the right direction. Absolutely. Hopefully we can just keep paving that road in order to find success consistently like they have. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, and who knows? You know, they've just won the national championship this last year. That's where our eyes are set, man. I'm you know? sure, yeah. And, and it ha you have to have that kind of ambition in order to create that culture and create that vision and bring in the right guys in order to continue to find that consistent success. So again, you know, w with that being said, like we've come a long way and the future is even brighter for us. I'm extremely excited to talk to you more about it today. Yeah, I'm excited too, because I'm following, I'm, you know, I'm always looking to see, you know, you guys succeed and uh, not just the men's soccer team, but also the women's soccer team too. You mentioned you played for mm -hmm. Willamette University yeah. as well, right? So a question that I have for you, as a player back then, were you already thinking about becoming a soccer coach in the future or that wasn't a thought back then? It wasn't. No, it wasn't. I, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of the typical college kid in that regard, you know, mm -hmm. like 
you're at 21 years of age, you're finishing up your degree, you're moving on to 22 years of age, but the time feels old, right? You're like, yep. man, like I'm, I'm getting up in those years. What am I gonna do with my life? Mm -hmm. um, and I was an exercise science major here, so exercise and health science. And through like our thesis project, right, as a senior, one of the options you can choose is to uh, take an internship. So a project kind of focused around exercise and health science, sports science, mm -hmm. and positively impacting your community, right? So here in Salem, we have the local soccer club just right down State Street here, uh, Capital FC. Mm -hmm. And some of the connections here at Willamette at the time through soccer were kind of like, you know, if you're looking for an internship and you're short on ideas, and I kind of was at the time, think about talking to CFC. They have tons of projects that, that, that you might just look at and kind of fall into. So I went over there for like an informational meeting. Um, he kind of had a list of ideas and the one that kind of stood out to me the most was a college information night. So at, yeah, I'd say, I think I'm 22 at this point, you know, um, I helped the club put on kind of their first annual college information night. Yeah. And, you know, we hosted it here in the gym uh, and I invited over a couple college coaches that I had known, some people at CFC had known, um, and you know, we got like, I think five panelists or something like that. It wasn't anything crazy. And, and the names- For the first one to start. No, it's, bad. It, you yeah. know, it, was, it was actually pretty good. Uh, I had a lot of help uh, and, and I was very thankful for that help. But at 22, I'm like, oh shoot, like, you know, uh, I'm standing up in front of a crowd of, you know, not many people, like 40 people in the stands, but you know, like most of them are high school kids and they're there to learn about the college recruiting process. And I thought we did well. We had uh, every division represented, NAIA, D3, D2, D1. Uh, JUCO, I think, was there too, if I remember correctly. And um, there was a lot of good questions answered that night for the kids that did attend, you know. But for the first annual, I was hoping it'd be a little bit bigger, right? I was super well prepared. I had all these pamphlets of info and all this stuff. And, um, but that was the internship that I basically did and got involved at CFC. And that kind of opened my eyes for in a couple different ways, like the college recruiting process in general, right? Like just really the, the, the bits and pieces, the stats, but also just what can I bring to the event that's really gonna help these young student athletes navigate their process most effectively? How am I gonna open their eyes and their minds to it's not just D1 or bust, which I'm sure we're gonna talk more about today. Wow. You know what I mean? There's just so many, so much opportunity in college soccer men's and women's, there really is. And, and uh, that's really what I wanted to bring to the, the, the forefront of that conversation that night was, you know, and I've already said it, like D3, man, there's 400 plus opportunities to play at Division Three. It's the largest opportunity across the board. So as a college soccer player, yeah, you can go D1. Yeah, you can go D2, you know. Uh, financially, what's gonna save you a lot of money is probably staying at the local JUCO right, and, and, and starting your degree there, which I think is a, a great option, by the way, you know. But if you are looking at the most statistically abundant opportunity, it's D3. Educating folks in that light, oh, and also NAIA too, right, that opportunity as well, that just a lot of people, they don't know, it. they're like, NAIA, like, there's NCAA, but yeah, there's, there's a whole nother organization for college soccer that you can actually fall under, and there's a lot of good opportunities there too. You know, uh, one of the preseason games that we'll always schedule is Corbin University. They're here in Salem. NAIA. NAIA, on the men's side, that's a top 25 program. They are good, they are very good. Um, that coach does a great job over there. Uh, an elite program throughout the country, you know, but NAIA is another great opportunity for young men and women to look at. But that's kind of what I learned from that project was, man, like the college recruiting process, there's just so much opportunity and I wanted to help share that with the student athletes, especially when I've been in their shoes and you do, you do feel a little bit helpless at times. You're like, I don't know where to go. I don't know where to look at. And it's either that dichotomy of there's so few options because I, I'm just a little bit ignorant and I haven't really done my homework or you do so much homework and you're so well versed in the research that there's almost too many options. Like where do I want to land, vice versa, right? And that was such a cool project for me to work on and kind of help open up the minds and eyes of some of these student athletes that we were talking to that night and kind of start that process for CFC. They've carried it on since, 
um, which is cool that, that I was, I can say like my name was at the start of that and, and, and going into the second year of that. 22 years old too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but it allowed me to kind of jump in with CFC um, in a, another different role, right? Like after I graduated, they were like, hey, we, we need some coaches. You know, every club soccer uh, organization always is looking for more coaches, you know? And at the time I was young and with my exercise science background, they were like, hey, you know, we, we're starting the, uh, the development academy here at CFC and we really want to make it as professionally driven as possible with your background in sports and exercise health science can you kind of run the strength and conditioning aspect for some of these younger athletes and I was like sure no problem you know no problem and that's kind of where I got my start in soccer so you do have a background on that too because of the degree that's that's yeah, awesome yeah, yeah, that's yeah. interesting and, and that actually translated uh, a few years down the road once I was kind of getting done with CFC I had met, and we kind of talked about this just off camera about how like in sports science, I find that like some of the biggest influences here in the American game are the Brazilians, right? They really mm -hmm. look at the sport. But I say that because one of the gentlemen that I had the pleasure of working for was a guy named uh, Garga Caserta. And Garga Caserta was the performance manager for the Portland Thorns. And he was actually doing some workshop stuff down here in Salem and I got to know him and at the time he had mentioned he was looking for an intern. And I was like, man, like, I would love to work at the professional level of the game in sports science and see what that's like. I did that for a season and it was an incredible experience working with those athletes. I mean, but it also showed me, Armando, that the sports science side of the game isn't actually what I was passionate about. It was the technical and tactical aspects mm -hmm of football that I was like, this is where I want my career to go. And that was already starting to solidify at CFC, being that club coach, kind of doing, working with some teams and things like this. But I didn't exactly know. And again, that was probably like at age like 25. It wasn't totally certain yet, you know? But after that experience, I realized sitting in on the meetings with the technical staff, talking about what the training was gonna look like that day, game planning for the opponent, the, 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 the culture of the team, just kind of breaking all those minerals and pieces down, that's where I was just glued, you know what I mean? That's where I just absorbed so much more information and I realized that's what I was passionate about when it comes to this game. And I was very fortunate after that to get uh, the assistant position on the women's side here at Willamette, which then kind of you know went into the assistants uh, on the men's side. And after the head coach left then, I got that call. Right. And that call was just, you know, a uh, mentoring friend of mine, Jared Rust, moving on, just saying, I don't know who I would trust more to take on this program than you when I leave. So he's in Florida now with him, him and his family, you know, and, and he left July right before the season about to start in 2021. So I got tagged at the interim. Right. Because there wasn't going to be any time to open up a hiring process or any of this. And again, I, I think I was lucky in that regard that um, they didn't open up a hiring process. It could be someone else in this chair right now. Right. You know what I mean? And you didn't have an assistant coach mm -mm. back then, right? No. When you took, yeah. I was the assistant, yeah. And ultimately, like, I was extremely honored. Uh, the timing was really nice. And uh, I took a really, really strong team. I inherited that. Mm -hmm. um, and that was my first season on the job. And second season in, we've, we've made some, some big strides, some big end huge, roads. And huge. that's kind of my story, like leading up into to today, man. And, and it's, been, it's been an amazing journey, honestly. It's been incredible. That's cool. We mentioned uh, recruiting. Yeah. If you have tips, you know, for athletes who dream of playing mm -hmm. uh, uh, college soccer, what would be those tips? You know, I think first and foremost, I'm a little biased, right? Because ultimately, like the stats I just mentioned is the biggest amount of opportunities at Division Three, right? Um, but I think, you know, for a lot of the recruits that I speak with and where I find the most respect for those student athletes is when they shoot for the stars a little bit, right? And for some of those kids, it's really realistic to say, look, like, I want to go Division One. I want to even be a Division One if it's like a mid-major, right? Because mm -hmm. you look at the Division One landscape, there's the big schools we all know the names of, and those are like in the Power Five conferences, you know, the, the Pac-12, the SEC, the ACC, the Big 12, um, et cetera, et cetera. 
those programs, what those kids sometimes don't understand is those programs are either going to take national team prospects, really, really high quality internationals, or just, you know, like kind of the safe recruit, right? Like, oh, I know this kid's played in the top academy in the country. Uh, that counts, huh? That, no. mm -hmm. You know, uh, if I have a kid that's coming from FC Dallas, I know he's legit. Mm -hmm. Versus a kid that's maybe also playing in the MLS Next system, that's at technically like a lower tier. Still MLS, right? Still an amazing uh, amount of quality in that league, and that player is probably really good, but... He's not an MLS affiliate in terms of the club he plays for, right? He might play for, like, Metropolitan Oval on the East Coast or something like this that plays against, like, the Red Bulls Academy and New York City FC, but he's not in those clubs, right? So that kid, if he's, like, 13th, 14th on the depth chart at a good MLS side but not, like, the one of the MLS sides – I would tell that kid, look, it's important that you look at Division One, because there's a lot of opportunity there too, you know, like 150 to 200 opportunities in terms of school, men's soccer programs, mm -hmm. a little bit more on the women's soccer side because of Title IX and how many of those schools have football, and then you need to balance it out through Title IX on the athletics end. So how do they do that? They add women's soccer. So a lot of schools like USC, for instance, they don't have a men's soccer team. They have a women's soccer team, and they have a very, very prestigious, well-known football team. Mm -hmm. And a lot of those Power Five conferences, as we're talking about, that's kind of how they map it out. A lot of women's soccer opportunity, even more so in those Power Fives than men's soccer opportunities, right? So women's soccer on the D1, there's a little bit more opportunity there. Um, on the men's side, a little bit less, right? But if you're that 13th, 14th kid on the depth chart at a strong team, but it's not technically an MLS affiliate, it's important to look at Division One because I think you should know your quality, right? And you should respect your quality and respect the work that you've put in to get to that point. But I'll always tell that kid, look, this is exactly how Division Ones are kind of building their roster. They have some of the top kids in the country and in other countries coming to them. And Armando, like, we can probably go another hour and a half talking about the transfer portal and how that's affected things as well and how that's really impacting rosters on top of COVID, COVID eligibility. Because the COVID eligibility now, kids are allowed to stay at certain institutions five or six years. Interesting. And what's also happened now at the NCAA, they literally just passed this, is you know, with red shirt, you can go red shirt uh, for physical reasons, right? Like you, you're telling me off camera, like you blew out your ACL. Right. You know, that would be a red shirt uh, opportunity for you where it's like, hey, Armando, like you're not going to play this year. Just save it for a you're going to save it for a future season. Mm -hmm. They now have a mental health waiver as well. How new is that? It's, it's brand new. It's just passed. I was not aware of that it's one. It's just passed. Yeah, so they, they just had the convention uh, earlier this year. And that was one of the legislations that just went through, is now you can have a mental health red shirt as well. And, and that will be similar as well. You, you take that year exactly, off. And exactly, for some type of hardship. And, and that makes a lot of sense, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Especially as mental health becomes uh, more of a... More of a more of something you can forecast and really kind of like um, have more awareness about, right? And, and, and really know how to support. Like that's one of my biggest learning curves I feel like as a coach is being that mentor on that side of things to our emotionally intelligent young men and women that come in through our doors these days. So I think that's a great thing to have in place. But again, we're talking about the eligibility and the impacted uh, rosters. You really can have almost six years now as a player and so with Division One, it's difficult for kids that want to look that route because the opportunity is just a little bit slimmer at this point in time because of the COVID eligibility still kind of seeing its way out, right? Uh, because that will wind down as soon as the COVID eligibility isn't a thing because our first years right now can't use that extra year for COVID because they didn't get held back because of the coronavirus, coronavirus. right? They didn't lose a season because of the coronavirus. But before that, you know, a lot of players had to miss their season. So they get that season back. That's only fair. That's only fair. Right. To them, that makes right? sense. Yeah. So because of that extra eligibility right now, a lot of those kids that maybe could be a Division One kid have to kind of look at Division Two and Division Three and NAI opportunities. Right. And that's where I would tell that kid that's 13th, 14th on that depth chart. Man, you come play for me at a Division Three. You're going to get a great education. 
you're probably going to make a more uh, meaningful impact on our team with playing time, right? Right away, mm -hmm. most likely. And then with all of that, man, your four-year experience that you're seeking is going to be extremely legitimate in that way. Whereas even if you did go to Division I, you're part of a pool of players that's just as good as you, if not slightly better. And that's okay, you know, because a lot of kids are like, hey, I want to compete for my spot. Mm -hmm. I'm like, I get that, man. I love that. I love that. That's the reason I'm recruiting. Exactly. You know I mean? It makes, it makes a lot of sense. The team. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I'm like, just think about bringing that same mentality in with us where I think our roster is extremely competitive. I think we have a lot of guys that probably could have gone Division One or Division Two, and, and decided that the team culture here, the education here, um, and the vision for what we have is, and obviously their individual impact that is never guaranteed because the one guarantee in this program is there is no guarantees, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. But that's usually how I sell us personally, you know what I mean? Is like, look, you're going to have an opportunity here to have a four-year experience that you probably couldn't get a Division One, And then on top of just like what makes Willamette special about Willamette also is just the selling point itself, right? That's also going to get kids in the door too. Um, so with all that being said, my advice for any of those kids that are in that position where they're super talented players is just keep your options open. You know what I mean? Because if Division One doesn't work out, you probably need to be having conversations with the D2s and the D3s that you also really appreciate, respect, and like. Mm -hmm. So when Northwestern says, hey, we've made all our decisions for the season, good luck in your search, you've been talking to a coach that you're like, you know what, coach, I'm ready. Like, I'm ready to commit. Let's make, let's, let, instead of having to now just redo your entire search exactly. and have to now seek a home where it's all of a sudden March or April and the season starts in that August, that's a huge stressful moment for a student athlete where they have to really kind of backpedal on a lot of the work they've done and now find something else, right? That's difficult for, for a really young man or woman. That's difficult. extremely yep. stressful emotionally. So I always advise just keep your options open. Talk to programs at every division. So when something doesn't work out, when you're shooting for the stars, at least you have a place to land, mm -hmm. you know, um, and, and make sure you choose those schools for the right reasons. I always encourage our young men to come visit. You don't want to do the virtual tour. You don't want to do these things where if you haven't walked the campus in your own shoes. You haven't been to the facilities and seen it with your own eyes. You know, a lot of the virtual tours that campus has put together, like they'll do a great job uh, making the campus just look astounding. It's a sunny day on that virtual tour. You exactly. Know? Like, what's it like when it's a little bit cloudier? The weather's not as nice. Um, you know, and then also like sitting in on the classroom too. What are the professors like? What is that environment like? Um, so anytime someone comes in for us, like we try to get them into the classroom at least for an hour that they're here. You know, so they can experience what the education's it's not just the athletic exactly. side of things yeah that makes it's going to be sense. so much more yeah it's not just know? soccer you have to like where you're at because again as as as, as ha what happened to you is like if you tear your acl or something are you still going to like the location that you're in are you still going to like the education that you're being provided mm -hmm. are you still going to have friends the people yeah and, and are you going to enjoy the community that you're in it can't just be about football it can't. That's as much as that's probably the driving factor to a lot of the decisions that they're making, they have to look at everything as a, a holistic picture. Mm -hmm. So my advice to anyone is like, look at the whole picture when it comes to that opportunity and what that institution has to offer, mm -hmm. um, what that community has to offer, what that location has to offer, because hopefully you'll be there for four years. Yeah. You know, yeah. Um, unless you're uh, a young man or woman that says, look, like I'm going to start here. And then I'm going to continue to pursue my D1 dream after maybe a year or two here. I'll jump into the transfer portal and try to achieve that myself. I'm fine helping out that young man or woman too. I am, you know, because I love the aspiration behind that. Um, but ultimately what ends up happening too is, you know, we've had some of those cases where they do end up kind of at year two when it's about that time where I bring them in for an individual meeting and I say, okay, like, are we gonna talk about transferring? Like, I'm, I'm ready to help you do it. You know, I really like it here, coach. I don't think I'm gonna move on. 
And that's always really interesting to hear, you know, is that like that was kind of their dream coming in, but they've enjoyed it so much. They've really found a home here. So at the end of the day, too, you have to understand that like that could be your dream, but be ready for that end road and that vision to possibly change based on the value of the experience that you're having. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's that's super well said because it isn't just the game. I mean, you're coming in, you're going to school, you know, you create a community, you you start making friends as yeah, well. Yeah. And that all counts. It's not just, you know, I'm sure a lot of players, you know, they they think about, oh, I wish this was just mm -hmm. training sessions, games, season, and yeah. that's it. Yeah, 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 yeah. But it isn't. Right. It isn't. You got to do good at school as well. Mm -hmm. You got to get, you know, good grades too. So, yeah, that's very well said. Thank you. Yeah. And and go, you mentioned which was super interesting to me, I didn't know about the mental health of uh, right. things. Right. How can athletes balance school, mm -hmm. soccer, mm -hmm. life while in college? Yeah. There's never a perfect answer to that in my opinion. You know, it, it's really up to the individual based on what their needs are, right? If we have someone that comes in and part of their scholarship, scholarship package is gonna be uh, work study, which essentially means that you know, you're mandated to be kind of a student employee here on campus. Some financial packages uh, require that, right? They'll say, hey, you get an extra 3,000 in aid if you can work on campus uh, outside of your fall. And that's actually what I did as a student athlete is mm -hmm. part of my financial aid package was work study. I worked sporting events outside of my fall season. I'd be at the score table for basketball. Yeah. I'd be shagging balls for like home runs or foul balls at baseball games. You know, I'd be uh, raking the the high jumper or uh, not high jump, long jump pit uh -huh. for track and field. You know, someone would make an indent after their after their jump, and I'd be there with the rake, and I'd get paid whatever you know, like minimum wage hey, per something. hour, right? So that's part of your work study package, but it really comes down to the individual to make sure that they understand: Am I going to need something like that that's going to be pretty part-time or am I going to need to jump into like a full-time position while I'm in school? Like what kind of financial aid help and assistance will I need while I'm here? For the person that's working full-time, it's doable, you know? And, and I want to say that to anyone that's kind of worried about that balance is, is I've seen time and time again ambitious people come in and, and succeed down that road, you know, where they have to maintain a full-time job on top of soccer trainings, cool. on top of going to class, on top of getting their assignments done, um, what are the sacrifices that you have to make? Mm -hmm. And I want people to always think about what those sacrifices are and looking closely at those and are they willing to make that sacrifice? You know, when your friend who doesn't maybe have the same amount of sacrifices that you do uh, in college goes, hey man, like let's go, let's go grab a bite to eat. You know, or hey, let's go hang out at so and so's place. Um, let's be social. Mm -hmm. I can't, man. You know, I I I gotta I gotta focus on my studies. I only have like this block of my day right now, so it takes a certain amount of discipline, right? And just being honest with yourself about how much time you need to manage all of that, and to make sure you're succeeding in all areas. Mm -hmm. And I think that we're really lucky here at Willamette because we do a really good job finding the right people that can hold themselves professionally on and off the pitch, you know? And when you find a lot of like-minded folks like that in the same community, you always kind of have people driving each other, you know? That definitely helps. Hey, I'm going to the library to study. What are you doing right now? Oh, I'm gonna grab a quick bite to eat and then I'm gonna go to the gym. Sweet, you know, I'll meet you up later if you want to, if after the gym, if you want to come study with me, I'll still be here. Perfect, love it, right? Like, so even as friendships start to, get created, there's not so much a focus on the social if there's still work to be done, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. and, and, and that discipline is there. Um, so my advice to anyone that's looking at those types of balancing acts, it's not easy. It takes discipline, it takes structure, it takes time management. If you're someone that knows that you're gonna need a little extra help, every campus has a resource, right? And that's what you have to kind of seek out I mean, especially at bigger division ones, some student athletes are kind of awarded some of those uh, resources right to their face. Those people kind of come to them. What do you need? 
And that's fantastic. Mm -hmm. You know, I think that's amazing for like to kind of talk outside of soccer because I think it's really prevalent with like basketball or football. The tutors and some of these things that these student athletes are provided, um, I think it's I think it's exceptional. Mm -hmm. You know, and and I'm really happy that schools take those resources seriously and say let's provide this student athlete every opportunity to succeed. Mm -hmm. You know, um, and then we'll lam it. At a Division three, those resources aren't necessarily handed to you, but if you are seeking those out, they're there. They're there. Yeah, they're there. And the accessibility to those resources, because we are kind of a smaller school size, uh, school size, that's also going to be part of your decision that you have to kind of think about. Is like the accessibility to the resources, because it's a smaller school, it's uh, it's just that much more accessible for that student athlete, right? Mm -hmm. And that's something that I was really uh, thankful for in my time as a student athlete was like, if I needed a tutor, Armando, I could find someone pretty quickly. If I needed help with my chemistry assignment, I could find someone pretty quickly. And again, small school, it was probably someone I knew and trusted yeah. and said, you know what, hey, like, uh, shout out to Jill Phillips. Jill Phillips like was a women's soccer player here in my time. She's the reason I passed my my second year of chemistry. That's awesome. You know what I mean? That's but awesome. like, that's the community you create. And and that's kind of what like you need in order to like create that balance and that structure is you need to know exactly what you are going to need, what is necessary for you as an individual, and then recognize when you need help and ask for ask it, right? For it. Don't be shy about saying like, I'm struggling in this area. I'm struggling to be the best version of myself. Mm -hmm. Coach, what do I do? It's like, okay, well, I got you. Right. Like, let me let me help you find some of these resources. Let, let's get you plugged and, and make sure that um, you're finding success in these areas where maybe you're not finding so much success. Right. I think that's key. It's, it is. It's, I think so. It is. But you got to be honest with yourself. Mm -hmm. And then with that honesty and sometimes vulnerability, because it's not easy to ask for help sometimes. You not know? at all. Yeah. But with that, it's it's understanding like, OK, this is my format that I need to kind of fall under. Financially, maybe I do need to hold a nine to five or something along those lines. So how is my class schedule gonna work within that? How flexible is my employer? How flexible is my coach if maybe like I'm like, hey, I'm running late to practice, you know? Mm -hmm. Those things are all important to kind of understand again in making your decision. And I really appreciate when a prospective student athlete or recruit kind of asks me like, if I was to hold a position, you know, obviously we hold a really high standard in our program, guys can't be late. That's how I help designate who should play over who. But when someone's really transparent and honest about their situation, I can be flexible if someone's going to be a little bit late from their from their job. You communicate. Yeah. Or from a lab, because maybe they're in a, a science class that has a three-hour lab. Mm -hmm. And our practice was already set at 4.30 p.m. Coach, lab gets out at 4.45. Okay, make sure you're there as close to 4.45 as you can be. And they usually do a pretty good job, you know what I mean? So um, it's a balancing act for sure. It's not easy. I can't pretend that it's easy, yeah. but it takes that discipline and structure and the honesty and vulnerability with yourself to make sure that you are asking for help when you need help and that you know who to ask and your coach is always going to be a great resource in order to guide you in that process. So for anyone that's listening to this, make sure you talk to that college coach in the recruiting process about how they can help you when there is those hurdles and obstacles that you need to help uh, overcome that you need to clear, right? Right, right. That's 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 awesome to hear too. What does a typical day look like uh, for a player during the season? Yeah. Now that same player, you know, he or she, they have you know a job as well. They got to go to class. They got to go to training. They have to rest. Yeah. Right. They got to be ready for the games because it's season. How does that work? Yeah. So for every institution, it's a little bit different, right? But I'll speak on behalf of us and, and kind of how we operate. Realistically, classes start 8 a.m. every day and they end around 4 p.m. every day. That's just the academic part of the calendar that in athletics we always have to be diligent about, right? Mm -hmm. um, so from 8 to 4, I'm not really going to ask any of our student athletes to focus on anything to do with us as the program, right? As soon as they're out of class for the day, 4.30 and on basically, now you're with me, right? Mm -hmm. now, now that's where you can also like just kind of step away from some of the hardships of academics 
and hopefully come into like what you truly enjoy and what you're truly passionate about. And again, some of the reason while you're while you're mostly here, right, is is to be that uh, that footballer, right. Mm-hmm. And I think with that, it's important to understand that they, on their own time, if they have a break between classes, might hop into the gym and get an extra strength session in. Might go out to the field and get some touches, right? Whatever they feel like they need to do in order to feel like they're at their best. But most of that chunk in the day, get ahead on your assignments. Talk to your advisor, talk to your tutors, have those meetings, work on an essay, uh, study for that test, do your homework. You know, that's, that's the chunk of the day where we need you to be, again, disciplined and professional about that yeah. part of it. Work your job, mm-hmm. right? And then as soon as that time hits, especially during the season, bring your full 100% attention and focus to what we need you to do. Being, being flexible with the focus as well. Exactly. I think it's, it's, it's huge for them to understand too. Yeah. And that might help them not get overwhelmed because, right. okay, they're in class right now, but they're thinking about you know, soccer, they're thinking about their jobs. Mm-hmm. But if they learn how to be a little bit more flexible with the focus, I think that could, could definitely help them. Yeah. And it's interesting, right? I can kind of map it out like based on the four years of the student athlete experience, that flexibility and focus and just that ability to say like, okay, I was here and now I'm here. This is what it's I was like focused a on switch, before. It, it is a little bit of a switch. And for the first year athlete, the, the transition between those two blocks in the day during the season, it's difficult. They get kind of hung up on like the stressors, being in a new place for the first time. Some of those things that just inherently uh, affect you, right. whether you like it or not. Right. So for a first year student athlete, it's always a little bit more difficult uh, for that person to perform on the field at 100%. Because usually those stressors are just gonna affect your game, whether you like it or not. Mm-hmm. It's funny, Armando, like the second year for a player is where that switch usually happens, is where they're like, okay, I understand how this works now. I get it, I, feel I felt comfortable. this out, yep, yep. I'm more comfortable. Now all of a sudden their game increases significantly in terms of quality because they just know how to manage this part of their yeah. lives that much more effectively. It's not new anymore. Mm-hmm. It's not a big stress ball anymore. Now it's like, okay, this is how it goes. Turn the switch on. I've walked through the white lines. I've walked through the fence. I'm here on the training pitch. Boots on, tentative, ready to go. Time to go, yep. What do we got, coach? You know what I mean? Junior year is where you can like maximize that potential, right? Because you're comfortable now, but now you aren't struggling from the year one transition to year two. It's like, okay, this is, I, I, I feel not only comfortable, but I feel confident, right. right? And that transition, that switch as you're alluding to, like just happens so much more naturally that year. And then senior year is kind of a whole nother ball game because for a lot of folks, it's their last season. And they're already looking for maybe the next step as well, huh? And that's kind of another stressor that mm-hmm. sometimes even brings them back to like what they felt like maybe in year one a little bit. Um, that's why junior year is like such a sweet spot in terms of performance for a lot of student athletes. And can you see that difference as well in between, you for know, sure. year one, two, oh, three, yeah, four, for yeah. Sure. I, I can almost like, you know, map that out for somebody, right? Yeah. And I kind of warn them ahead of time, like, just be ready for this. This is what it's gonna, just in general, this is what it's gonna feel like, this is what it's gonna, what it's gonna be like. Senior year, if, They've done a lot of good work to map out what their future is going to look like. They're all good in their classes. That can also be a year for an individual that their achievements, their accolades, their professionalism is at an all-time high. But I do see from some folks, and I was kind of like one of the average kids that struggled into this, was like there can be some of those stressors of like, what am I going to do with my future? You know, And just like that's always kind of in the back of your mind my classes are at like an all time high in terms of their yeah. difficulty as a senior. That's not easy to bring into their training environment when so many things are on your plate. Mm-hmm. That kind of mounts back on senior year a little bit for some kids, it did for me personally, you know? But if you're one of those seniors that you've managed your time well and uh, everything's kind of laid out nicely because you've kind of taken the time to figure it out year three and year two on what year four looks like, there's a lot of forward thinking kids like that, you know, and, and I'm lucky enough to work with a lot of those individuals, uh, those young men, um, just mature, professional, right? Like that's where senior year, all of a sudden you can be like stand out and is completely above the rest and know exactly how it's going to be. And that's the type of kid that usually a coach would say like, you're going to be our team captain because you're just an example. Mm-hmm. 
of what it should be like. You know what I mean? And how to carry themselves at that point in their career. Yeah, that's that's uh, that's awesome. So now, w what do you look for? You know, for preseason, because that's a huge debate. Mm. You know, it, it has always been you know a massive debate because you have that entire time to prepare yourself to come in and be ready, yeah. right? But you don't have the coaches there with you. Right. International players, they mm -hmm. go back home. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You don't know what's going on, yeah. right? Even the kids from here, they're away from school, away from you. Right. So what do you look for for those that are coming in for preseason? And, and I'm sure that you guys give them, you know, hey, do this. Yeah. Yeah. So you can yeah, get yeah. here ready. Right. You know, you're not wasting my time. You're not wasting your time and you're good to go. Yeah. Ooh. It Again, based on the individual, it's such an interesting conversation. As you're saying, we give them that guided structure. Here's a workout packet with all the bells and whistles, game analysis, technical work, obviously a lot of physical work. You know, the, the That's most the time. important thing coming in for your fall is going to be that fitness. There's just not time in the season. It's too short it's to too say short. like, okay, you're going to build fitness from day one to the end of the season. It, it's, it's not going to happen. Yeah. And it's so physically demanding that if you kind of understand that stress curve when it comes to that physical load, you face so many ups and downs in terms of maximizing what you're doing energy-wise and that physical component and how that drops and how you need to recover and how it drops again, you know, like that, that there's the sports scientist in me coming out a little bit, but like mm. that curve just hits so, so much highs and lows during the season that you need to take the summer to make sure that your peak fitness is coming in the first day of fall. Correct. Because you just can't build it in that short amount of time, especially with how many trainings we have, how many games we have, et cetera, et cetera. I think that might ha that might be overload, you know. Yes, for, exactly. You know, like that could cause them to get injured and not even be able to play the season. Exactly. Right? right. Because now all of a sudden we are putting a certain volume on an individual, because most of the team can manage it. But if you're the individual that can't, is exactly that you're gonna get injured. Mm -hmm. So coming in fits important, but for a lot of our guys too, we want to put them in challenging environments in their summer. Mm -hmm. And you worked with Lane United, right? Right. So that is a USL2 opportunity. And shout out to Connor Capaletti and yep. John, John Gallus. Gallus. I mean, those guys do an excellent job with that outfit. Huge. That's an opportunity in the summer where college players can look to get more minutes under their legs, mm -hmm. still have that fitness component, still have all the components where they are being challenged throughout their summer. So when they come to the fall, it's like clockwork. You've been doing it all summer. Ready. So it rolls right in. So for me, we ask a lot of our guys, and I will help a lot of our guys find those opportunities, those type of opportunities. If it's not USL 2, is it UPSL? Mm -hmm. Is it NPSL? Or is it just like the pickup that's run by the ex-professional in your exactly. area? You know, like Something. what are you doing in your summer to actually play the game and challenge yourself in that environment as much as possible so when you do come in the fall, you're ready to go. Mm -hmm. And you've almost mm -hmm. improved your capacity as a player in order to make sure that come the season, you're not only ready and you're not just surviving, but you're thriving, thriving. right? Yeah. And I think like that's been really big for me in my two years here is just making sure that every player has an opportunity in their summer to try to play the game at a high level and challenge themselves in that environment. And based on the individual, it might not even be getting minutes. It might be like, hey, join that outfit and just train. Train. And just train yep. with them because that's still gonna be enough for you, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, but if no one's got a team, if no one's got something at home where they're like really comfortable and they feel like it's really gonna challenge them and, and their growth and feel like they're prepared and ready to go when they first step on campus in the fall, that's what the workout packet's for, right? That general structure of just saying, hey, if nothing else, this is what you can take home with you to make sure that you are good and ready. So you see, like you're providing that stuff, right. you know, they're not just going home with nothing. Right. You know, so I think that in, there's not one, I haven't met one yet that's like, okay, I'm going to go for the summer break. And you know what? Whatever, preseason. Yeah. Season, I, I don't mind it. Right. No, they all want to come in. Yes. Kill it preseason yep. to be ready and start playing, you know, the season. Mm -hmm. So, and most of them sometimes they, they, I did, I took it for granted. 
Hmm. You know, yeah. I, I should have worked way more than I did during the summers to get back and play. After my injury, that's when I woke up. Yeah. But again, too late. Yeah. I <laughs> tore my ACL not once, yeah. twice. Yeah. That made me wake up and be like, wait a minute. I need to improve on my eating habits. I need to improve on my training, mm -hmm. on my rest. I need to do all of those things if I do want to keep right. playing the game. So, right. yeah, I, I hope they're watching, listening, and taking, you know, the advice and, and doing their stuff, their homework during the summer to come in, using the preseason to just, you know, sharpen up a few little things and get into the season and kill it. And, and that's where it's important to also understand kind of where you're at in the depth chart, where your prospects are going into your next year, what your vision is for your next season, you know? Because if you're a first year player and you just had a first team all region kid, first team all conference kid, first team all American kid playing in front of you and you kind of sat the bench a lot of the time, you're kind of looking at next season and going, I want to be that guy that's on the field. Exactly. I want to be a contributor. Right, I, I want to get a meaningful uh, impact in this program. Mm -hmm. I want to be that guy. And we have a lot of those kids right now, and that's what's really important to have is a lot of those kids that are really ambitious and saying, like, I want to be out there. But they will do what, everything it takes, as you're alluding to, to make sure that the work in the summer is put in. And when you have a group of guys that all have that collective mindset, that's where the success of the, success of the team from day one just becomes transparent mm -hmm. you go wow everyone's just flying around everyone's done their job this summer you don't want to be the one just you don't want to be the <laughs> one that's like you know what i didn't do enough yeah and you don't want to be the starter that earned all these accolades and then kind of took the summer off that's true. and then you come in and all of a sudden the guy that's behind you is right on your tail yeah. or now jumping you in the depth chart yep. and you're like coach what's going on and it's like you clearly didn't prepare with your time off. You clearly took your, your, and you your time know, off as, as a coach, holiday. you know. You, do, you know, yeah. for sure. Yeah. For sure. Um, and it's not just apparent to you as the head coach, it's apparent to every coach on the staff, and it's apparent to the rest of the to team. To the rest of the team. Everyone sees it. And now all of a sudden you have kids that were really favored at first, and now the rest of the group goes, coach, like, I think so-and-so is looking really good. I think if we want to find the most success that we can this year, so-and-so needs to start in order for us to make sure that we are winning games. Yeah. And being That's at our the best. That's the ultimate goal, yeah. And, and it always is. you know. And that friendly competition amongst teammates, that environment that you can cultivate really just makes the group tighter and tighter and mm -hmm. tighter and tighter. Mm -hmm. And when that happens from one to guy 32 on your roster – where everyone's competing for a spot. That's the difference right there. That's the difference. That's the difference. That's the difference. Yeah, let, let's, uh, the next question uh, goes into that too. What do you think is the most important qualities, you know, uh, of a successful college soccer player? Yeah, I, I would say the one that really pops out in my mind, resilience. Resilience, I think, is the first thing, right? Like, we, we talk a lot about discipline. We talk about character. We talk a lot about one of the mottos that I recruit by, and I'll say this because I think it's important for you to understand more about us, is like good people make good players, not the other way around. So I think we have a lot of kids that are just inherently good kids, like good people, good young men, right? Mm -hmm. um, not egotistical. They carry a lot of humility with them. Like it's, it's, I'm very fortunate in that regard to have a group of young men um, that we've kind of brought in because we've identified that part of them, knowing that that humility, that discipline, that professionalism is also what brings out the best in them on the pitch, mm -hmm. right? With that said, really what I continue to look for in our guys is that resilience. When things aren't going well, how do you respond? What is your response when you've, and, and, and we're talking about the big picture of the game you maybe aren't getting playing time or we just lost the game as a team. I think those are some of like the big picture things that you can look at and say like, well, how are you gonna respond? How's your resilience, right? The smaller moments even in the game, the transitional True. moments in the game, right? You've just lost the ball. How's your reaction to go win it back? You know what I mean? Um, 
or even on like the more positive end, we've just scored a goal. You've just scored a goal. Are you going to take the next five minutes off and say, great, like I've done well, or are you going to say, no, 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 let's go get another, let's go get another, you know, what, and that's not so much resilience as much as just like ambition and continuing that competitive mindset, right? So along with resilience, that has to be there too that insatiable hunger to be the best, right? Mm -hmm. And when you have someone that never gives up, even when they're up five nil in a training session, they wanna go for six, they wanna go for seven, right? That's the kind of kid that I'm looking for. And and again, that's a perfect world, right? right? But like at the end of the day, there's a lot of those kids that are out there and I think we're really fortunate to have a team of that kind of individual. With that, you know that the group in terms of competition is always going to make each other better every day because they're never just like satisfied exactly. with being okay. You know, they want to be exceptional. Yep. And when you have a group of guys that wants to all be exceptional. The sky's the limit. The sky's yeah. the limit. Yep. And that's what I'll say about just, again, like Willamette in general as a university is on the academic side, there's also kind of that same culture. You have a lot of people that aren't okay with a, a B or a C. They're like, no, no, I, I know I can be a better, I know I can do even better than that. No, that internship, that's unpaid, man. I'm going to make money when <laughs> right, I be an intern. You know what right. I mean? And I'm going to intern for Nike or Intel or a big organization and I'm going to make an impact as an intern. I'm going to do a really cool project that ensures that like my name and, and my image is with that CEO or with my supervisor. So when I do graduate, that's the first person I can put on a reference for resume or that's the first person I'll call to say, hey, remember I, yeah, man, you were exceptional. We'd love to hire you on. You know what I mean? Um, So I think that is what makes Willamette special is like you kind of have a culture of that just with the people around. Everyone's kind of pushing each other to be the best version of themselves. Coaches, faculty, professors, admin, um, they'll do great in their job, mm-hmm. you know, shout out to your wife, our social media director here at Willamette University, yes, man, like is. It, our social media is better than it ever has been. She's going to love to hear that. You know what I mean? And, and ultimately like that's the aspects of this university that continue just to grow and evolve, but it's the people in those positions that are like, okay, what more can I do? Yep. How can I be even better in this role? And I think in our athletics department, it's so cool to also see a group of coaches in each program also say, hey, you know, like, what are you doing in your team that helps you guys find the most success? And I'll do the same for with football or with basketball. You know, like, I'm always kind of trying to grab more and more and more, you know, and, and I know I can implement this or, uh, you know, that's good advice, but it's not really applicable to us or relevant to us or whatever it might be. So with all that being said, when you have that culture around a campus and the community, where everyone's just trying to be the best version of themselves, it just drives everything forward. Yeah, that's inspiring myself, actually, because, you know, if if having a team that they're all with that same mindset, yeah. like we talked about, it, it, the sky's the limit. Mm-hmm. And it's always like the guy on your side, he, she, they will realize that you're trying to always push yes. for more, yes. become better. Yep. So then that, that is going to, you know, everyone else is going to feel that. Mm-hmm. And I think that's always going to push the team to the right direction because no one wants to, you know, I won one tournament, you know, I'm fine with that. Yeah. I don't want it anymore. No. Yeah. We won one. Let's go for two, three, yeah. four, five, ten. 100%. If you want 100%. to. So this is great. We're getting to the end here and that uh, we have this question that we ask every guest. Tell us a game changer moment in your life and the reason why am i allowed to have two say it i think the first one uh is finding this place i'd have to say that was a game-changing moment in my life you know i'll be honest i wasn't like the top recruit coming out of southern california by any means you know like and i was definitely kind of the typical high school kid that uh excelled at my sport but wasn't super knowledgeable about the process, didn't do probably as much work as he should have in terms of recruiting himself and finding the right home, et cetera, et cetera. It was actually my twin brother that was being recruited here 
for American football. Interesting. Um, and him and I kind of came up and toured colleges in the area together. And uh, we came to Willamette. And I think we spent like one night here and, and I saw the campus and stuff. And I, I, I thought it was great, you know, but I was like, you know, this is, this is my brother's stuff. Like, this is really cool, but like, do I fit? Whatever, whatever. I actually flew home alone the next morning out of Portland because my team back home had uh, the state tournament, state cup, right? Mm -hmm. And back in Southern California, it's a big deal. It's super competitive, like yada, yada. So I, I flew home. Um, my brother and my dad actually ran into the head coach here for men's soccer at the time. They ran Is into that right? him. Uh, you know, they're just walking the halls with the football coaches and um, they kind of say, hey, this is the men's soccer coach. He's new here. He was, you know, it was, it was uh, his, his second season, I think, at the time and his first recruiting class. So he meets my brother, he meets my dad and my dad's like, yeah, you know, my, my other son who, who just left this morning to go to State Cup uh, was just here with us. He would have loved to have met you. And yeah, man, that's just, it's funny how the coach at that time just kind of said, well, you know, I'm looking for another kid to join the team and like fill a roster spot that we need. What position is he, et cetera, et cetera. And I ended up just being like a weird, perfect fit, uh -huh. you know? Um, so I got a call from that coach like later that week, but I didn't think Willamette was my home until it kind of found me. And that was so interesting to me, but that was a game changing moment for sure is saying yes committing to play here and just being in this chair today mm -hmm. and just kind of reliving that journey in my head as we talk about it now like it's humbling to say the least because like i probably didn't deserve the opportunity that i got but it presented itself and and i took the risk and i said yes and um, I did the work in order to, to do my best to be successful for someone that took the chance on me. And I think it paid off. Well, man, I think it did, you know? Totally. Um, so that was a game-changing moment. And I think the other game-changing moment that I think of is um, winning conferences last year. And uh, just being in front of our fans, in front of our alumni, in McMinnville at Linfield uh, on like the last day of the conference uh, uh, league season, the, the conference season, and we solidified with the win, the title. And, you know, I kind of go over to the fence just to say hi to everyone. And little did I know, like, all of my boys are behind me with the water cooler. Ah. And, you know, I'm getting pinned up against the fence, Armando. I'm getting pinned up. And I don't know why I'm being pinned up. I'm like, can I, like, move back, guys? Like, what's going on? And next thing I know, I'm being dumped, dumped. you know what I mean? And uh, I kind of realized then, like, okay, this is a moment that I will never forget. This is, this is my first as a coach. This is our second as a program. And this hopefully is not our last, you know? So I'm looking for that moment again, you know what I mean? You will. Especially because when I get pent up against the fence this time, I'll, I'll know how to You're gonna know, so yeah. get wet, you know what I mean? But You're going to find a way, though. Um, that was a game-changing moment for me just because I think it kind of sets – the vision forward that like this really is possible for our program. Awesome, man. Uh, this has been great. And again, thank you so much for taking the time to be here thank with us. Thank you for having me, Armando. Yeah, for sure. And uh, where can people find you and uh, Willamette University men's uh, team? My most used social media platforms on Instagram. So Sam Edelman 18, uh, that's, that's my tag. And then uh, Willamette men's soccer is just Willamette M sock. Willamette specifically, we usually use Instagram as well. Willamette University's Twitter and Instagram is definitely something you want to follow as well just to kind of gain more perspective on what the university's posting and what's happening just outside of men's soccer. There's a lot of really cool stuff there too. Um, again, shout out to the social media director here at Willamette. You know, she does a good job. So with that being said, I think that's where you can find me and find the most updated information on us. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you, man. Thanks for having me. This is a lot of yep. fun. Thank you so much for joining us today. And I hope you really enjoyed this conversation we had with Sam. Uh, FC Game Changer, the football club that will change your game.